just realized there is a balcony view too. I didn't know other, I would have, otherwise I would have you know, sat there. So uh, I'm Pracheta. I'm going to talk about how you can build a robust system for DR, right? Um, but before I get start, I would like to ask a couple of questions. One, I am presuming that everybody understands what is DR, disaster recovery, and it differs from what is HA, which is high availability. Yeah? We all have that basic understanding because I've got just 20 minutes. I'm not going to introduce disaster recovery. Uh, it's different than, you know, high availability and that's what we are going to go capture. Now, with another question that relates to that is how many of you have a DR solution in place? Okay. Some 20%? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some. Uh, is it better now? No? This is static? Okay. Okay. I'll try. <laughs> oh, give me a hand, but that's okay. But uh, when I'll be using, it'll be a challenge. Is, is it, there is a lot of static? Yeah? Let me, let me keep it in my hand, probably. It was a pocket. Okay. So, um, some 20% of you said you have uh, disaster recovery. Now, I, I truly believe that it doesn't mean that 80% of you do not require a disaster recovery solution, right? Yes or no? Yeah. Why do we need it? Because they can always things that can go wrong in your primary data center where you host everything and which is dear to you. And uh, yeah, you know, if the whole power grid goes off or there is a, God forbid, tsunami hits or something or the other. So, uh, while you build for high availability, your application databases, middleware always run, it's also important to build for disaster recovery, at least for your critical workloads. Now, those of you who said that you have DR in place, let me understand what is the good percentage of workloads that made to that DR, which means are you 100% workloads are available on the DR side? Not really, right? Probably it is 20-30% of it because DRs is supposed to be costly and complex. Are you guys with me? Yes? So what about others? You know, the 80% of you who have not really taken the next step to look at DR, chances could be, may, maybe you started two years ago or five years ago and, uh, you know, you have, ha haven't thought about it. Uh, or it could be, yeah, it, it requires, you know, uh, some money behind it to really build another site and have things ready. Now, while we go, while I'm, I'm going to talk about a complete DR scenario, uh, there, are, there can always be a situation where you can achieve something partially as well, okay? Um, I think by looking at the, the show of hands, I think uh, what I've tried to build in the slide will absolutely make sense to you guys. Now, let's get started uh, with this. Life would have been absolutely wonderful and I wish that, you know, a time will come when we have recovery on press of a button, right? Uh, but a it's not the case. It really requires planning, it really requires understanding of your infrastructure and then build solutions based on that. Now, um, when it comes to um, disaster recovery, there's one thing which is very, there's a misnomer and many a times I've seen people using uh, DR as a synonymous to backup, people using DR as a synonymous to high availability, that is not, right? So while in high availability, you expect your application services to be running all the time. Honestly, five nines are also passed. Today is the world of continuous availability. You just don't want your application to go down. And it's possible there are tools that will allow you to do that. That means your application always run, whatever fails, they can just, you know, run another node or run another uh, system, that's about it. Whereas backup is about, you keep on taking backups and you can restore from them in case something you know, really catastrophic happens and HA completely goes for a toss over, right? But DR is a little different. Of course, there has to be a backup. Of course, there has to be high availability to keep operations running. But DR is something that doesn't happen every month, every quarter or God forbid, it should not happen even in years. But that is like your good medical insurance policy. You don't want to meet accidents ever, but you want to be covered all the time. What happens when that happens? Right? So let's let's get started. Where to get start, right? Uh, that's a question I get a lot from customers of all sizes. You know, you might be a big enterprise with 100,000 uh, users or you might be a small organization, just 50 of you. 
um, you know, this is always a question. If I have to get started, where to get start? So good day, good time to get started. What yes, was it today? But today is also very good time to get started. So uh, let's see what are the, some basic things that you have to keep in mind while you think about DR and how you plan your DR. Okay. Uh, these are the four steps in my mind. Uh, in, of course, there's a lot of process. High level basis, you need to really understand uh, what is the scope of your DR. I your let's say you have got a hundred node uh, cluster. Let's say it's a very big cluster. Or it's a you know you have got ten clusters which are let let's say five node each or something or the other. Do you really want to build a DR for all of them, or do you want to segregate and find out which is the most cri critical in component in your organization, and you want to build a DR for that? Because what happens in DR? Uh, you have to have resources at some other end, which is not the same data center, right? So in in yester time, yester years, or let's say five years ago, the only way to build a DR was to have a DR site, another site which is 200 kilometers, 500 whatever kilometers away, and you have some compute there. You have a small data center, a bunch of machines there. Will just uh, you know a replica or copy of your uh, live running in. Uh, so that they can, you can switch over whenever there is a cap catastrophic, uh, you know, incident. Now times have changed with cloud; everything has changed. So you know, I'll little bit touch about how you can go with the traditional way, or you can look at something which is, uh, you know, easy to achieve in this easy gratification times. We really don't have time to, you know, spend two months in planning, etc. Can you quickly do it? We'll talk about that as well. But really, really start with understanding, you know your scope, what all resources you really want to be uh, under this DR policy. Think about uh, your requirement and strategy means do a, uh, as I said, I don't want to go into too many details about it because this can look very, very, uh, you know, um, time consuming process itself, but this is the right way of doing it. You can skip couple of them, but yeah, this is a good flow to get started. Uh, understand, you know, what is the business impact it, it's going to have if you are going to build a DR? Do you have uh, funds for it? Do you have IT budgets for it? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Of course, then, then implement it. And a very, very important part about it is testing. I have seen a lot of organizations who have DR plans till the time DR really happened. Yeah? So when it happened, it just didn't come up on the DR side. Why? Because it was not tested often. We all dread uh, of unknowns. We really, really don't want to uh, try out what if things fail. But the point is, today we are building for disasters. What if, I, I think in the morning somebody spoke about Simbin Army. You know, that, in, that is the world we are living in. We really want to build systems that can, that can absolutely um, sail through any kinds of uh, disturbances. So uh, let's, let's, I have a very high level architecture on basis of which I want to build. Um, so typically, you have a you know you have a on premises data center. It could be your own data center, or you have a co-location data center. Wherever you host your uh, host VMs, nodes, etc. Wherever you have your machines, so you may have some physical one. Mostly nowadays, everybody has virtual machines, right? Or you might have containers, Docker's, etc. Um, so you have got a primary site. Now the point is, the first thing is to establish a DR site. Now where it, this DR site is going to be, uh, by the virtue of so many new things today, that choice in your hands to sort of decide. You can choose to have a DR site in, you now if this is Bangalore, it could be a Chennai for you or it could be a Coimbatore or wherever, or uh, you can go ahead and choose to have a DR site on the cloud. Uh, which means uh, you don't want to invest into another data center, you can choose to uh, make uh, one of the clouds your data center. Um, now, what is very, very important to have a look at, I'm not getting into, uh, you know, in what all tools you can use, uh, maybe towards the end of the talk, but the point is the basics remain. You need to identify what all workloads should go there, how my data is going to be synchronized, because the most important piece of the puzzle is data synchronization and application uh, consistency, isn't it? I can definitely bring up a system on the other side, but what if the application doesn't load the way it is supposed to be? Or there is some, you know, there is some discrepancy in my database. Yeah? 
So it's very, very critical and that's the reason why a lot of organizations don't attempt it. Um, but it's very important to look at it. If you feel that your business applications are really need to keep on working. Now, in this case, this data channel could be anything. If you have got SAN on, uh, on, uh, on the primary side, you want to do SAN level replication, you can choose to do that. Or you can use a network channel to do the replication. Uh, in some cases, questions come, how do I, uh, you know, replicate so much of data? I might have terabytes, petabytes of data. How do I sync it for the first time on DR side? So typically use the offline method where you copy everything in big hard disk. Bring, uh, you know, bring it to your Chennai site or whatever is your DR site, uh, load it first and then do a sync rec replication, you know, over the network. That should be pretty straightforward. Um, uh, DR as a service. So as I said, now it's possible for you to not only build DR uh, the traditional way, you can also leverage something called as DR as a service. Essentially what it means, you can look at a cloud provider who, who will host the VMs uh, for you and uh, you know, you know, in a shut stage, in a sync fashion, whenever disaster strikes on your primary side, those critical machines will come to life on on the cloud uh, platform, right? So, why a lot of organize? This is 2014 report from Forrester, and it is it is growing up. Uh, why a lot of organizations are looking at it? One, uh, I do not have such a big infrastructure to really invest into another site and have cooling and all those racks and and build servers, it does, uh, doesn't make sense to me. So probably I'll, I'll, I'll just have those identified workloads to have a DR on the cloud. For others, I have seen you know a couple of organizations where they are really, really finicky about DR. So they do have a primary site, and second DR site, and then they do a triple DR. So for the extra important, the star applications, they go ahead and put a, do a DR from a DR to cloud. You know, that's like extra protection. So the point is, uh, it makes sense. Um, so probably you want to explore any traditional way of doing DR or uh, DR as a service. Now let's get to the some hows of it. You know what all you need to keep in mind, and that is really really essential for uh, DR planning. First of all, uh, I wanted to introduce this seven tiers, uh, which share is a standards uh, uh, in the DR world the seven stages in which your workloads can reside. Now, or probably I would, maybe a better way to put it is to categorize your application in data into various tiers. Probably, of course, your test and dev is not a critical workload. If it goes down for uh, four hours or, you know, maybe two days, if there is a catastrophic situation, probably it's all right. But let's take an example of a Chennai flood happen. Lot of organization who did not have DR were absolutely shut down for uh, yeah, days, right? So first of all, it's very important to uh, categorize your data. I have colored them. So tiers 0, 1, 2 are primarily just taking backups, which means if you are not taking backup, if this is various levels of taking backup. You have a backup as well as a hot site. What is a hot site? A place where you can restore backup if your primary site goes down, right? Somewhere where you can restore. Typically what happens, you take backups and you assume that when I have to restore backup, I will have my primary site with me to restore it back. But if disaster really happens and you cannot access your, your data center at all for days, then you have to have another site somewhere where you can go ahead and restore those backups, right? A second category is, you know, more to do with electronic disk-based uh, backup where you go ahead and uh, quickly restore data uh, without any loss, okay? Now this is uh, actually more to do with real DR, where there is almost no data loss and the point of recovery uh, is very, very fast. Please understand, we are talking about disasters, right? When power grid failed or when there is an earthquake, where the system cannot be accessed manually over the net, your, you know, fiber cables are cut, then, the, then we are talking about, you know, the, these disaster site. So what is more important? Uh, I'll skip in the interest of time. Another thing that you should keep in mind is how you want to keep it. If it is a very important workload, probably you not only want to do it locally in some other city, you also want to look at a, another geography or continent altogether if it is really, really important to you. Um, you, you go ahead, I'll, I'll share these slides, but the point is you think about whether you want the failover to be manual or completely automatic. Of course, 
nobody is looking at manual, but sometimes people want to save cost. They don't want to invest into our orchestration tools. So they, they just say, okay, anyways, it's a disaster. What if it takes 15 more minutes for me to bring up uh, manually on the other side? It saves me lots of money. Fair enough, it works for you. Otherwise, it's a good idea to think building automated DR. But one thing which is very important, where is that? Okay, I had one more slide. <laughs> Is it gone? It was really important. Okay, give me a sec here. <laughs> okay, how did this happen? Okay, anyways, uh, forget it. Uh, I, I wanted to introduce this thing to you guys. I did, did not know whether you know it, so I thought I'll introduce it. Uh, does everyone understand what is RTO and RPO? Yeah? Yes or no? No? No, okay, no, yes. So RTO stands for recovery time object and RPO stands for recovery point object. So RTO is how much time will it take for you to recover the lost data, whether it is, it can be 5 minutes for some organization which say, okay, if disaster really happens, I am okay to have a data which is old by 5 minutes. Others, it can be 30 minutes, some it can be 0 minutes, okay. A recovery point object is when disaster really strikes. You cannot expect 5 minutes when your DR will come up, right. It may be 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 4 hours. So define your RTO and RPO and it is a good idea to have different RTO and RPO for different set of applications because are, they are different criticality in your organization, right? So I had a slide for RTO and RPO very neatly, therefore I was looking for it. So yeah, these are the three, uh, these are the things that uh, are really important. There's definitely a trade-off. The, the lesser number of RTO and RPO you're looking for the costly affair it's going to be, right? Uh, so make a call. Uh, I have typically seen the DR planning to classification is the must. Once you have classified, because I've seen a lot of times people don't even classify their data. If I ask you where your high business impact data lies, you'll say, you'll say probably somewhere in my data center. That's not a great answer because you should know where exactly it resides, whether what kind of security measurements you have taken because you know, that's, that's the starting point of building a resilient system. So, um, with zero RPO, probably you are looking at a sandwich replication, etc. And uh, of course, it's going to be the most costly affair. Very, 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 very important is to test failure. Once you have set up stuff, make sure you test it every month or at least every quarter. Typically, all these good tools nowadays allow you to uh, do the testing of failure. What they do, they go ahead to the 99.9% .9 of the failure, simulate it and then bring it back. So your DR really doesn't happen, but it's more like a drill. So make sure that you test your DR. Okay, how much time I have? Okay, I'm just gonna uh, get to the last one. There are a lot of um, DR as a service provider. Of course, there are, uh, these guys also provide DR uh, solutions because typically you need some logic to go ahead and keep on pinging your primary and secondary side. Uh, if it is DR as a service, secondary could be cloud. Um, so I would really encourage you to, for 80% of you, if you are building your setup, if you are in the phases where the chances of you to go exponentially um, high on customer acquisitions and et cetera, it's a good time to start building your DR before it becomes a, you know, elephant in the room. So since I don't have any time, if you have any questions, Probably I can take one question? No? Okay. Very rude. Okay, I, I'll, I'll be around. You can, you can ask questions if you have any. Thank you.